Hello everyone. Someone sent me something to repair. This is my first opening of the box. It's an Amiga 500 motherboard. Apparently it has no video. Well, that's what he said at first and then afterwards he said that it has um, a green screen. Nice bag. Excellent. We have um, a friend for him. Steve from my A500 eBay lot. And Steve is my test board. The board in which I um, socketed every single chip uh, well, all the memory and all the logic and uh, even that bad um, serial chip. So, anyway, let's take a close look. The gentleman uh, said that he had a issue with one of the resistors over here and it actually smoked. Um, he told me he didn't remember if he replaced it or not. He said that if he did replace it, I would be able to tell to see. He also said he circled, he sent me a picture that he circled. Let me bring that up. All right, so. It's a 409 or something like that. I can't see it. I'm going to get my uh, magnifiers. So R409. I guess the R is covered over by the cat, the capacitor, but uh, it certainly doesn't look like that resistor has any problem. That solder looks quite original, actually. Doesn't it? I believe the gentleman said that he had recapped the board and it didn't fix anything. Um, we're going to check the uh, polarity of the capacitors to make sure that they're not accidentally reversed. Uh, but yeah, there, there's a little glob there and, and the flux is going in this direction so it might have run down. You might have had this thing propped up. And there's just a little bit over here, um, not too far away from this capacitor. Yeah. I'm just going to check the polarity of the caps, which should be, is pretty easy. You don't need a schematic for that because it's quite obvious where the ground is. And usually the caps have one end that's going to ground the, the normal ground plane on the board. So I'm going to just check that out first. Yeah, most of the capacitors look okay. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's almost like a different person, you know, did these. You know, because the other ones look like, you know, something I could have done. Uh, the, well, the cleanest looking ones. Uh, there's a couple that are kind of, yeah, I mean, what is that? You, are, you putting, are you putting the soldering iron uh, on this side of the board? That's the only explanation I have. Instead of just letting the solder flow through. That's just... Those are the two worst ones, anyway. That's the worst I've seen on this board. In case anyone has a question about... Well, I guess nobody really does, but... That's not the greatest work in the world. Um, but it's uh, passable. I did that. I think I was in the midst of fixing Steve 
and I was pretty frustrated and I was doing things a little faster than I normally would but um, yeah this is not what you want to do um, that and on this side it doesn't really look like there's a short necessarily I just feel like I should just fix these two clean them up I don't even see the leg of this one coming out it's just a solder blob there but yeah there's a lot of material here I think that um, I'm gonna rework these two the other ones are probably okay um, too much solder for sure and uh, maybe too much heat or something uh, it kind of looks like you, you know you were using a, a welder and you were using too much heat on a welder that's kind of what that looks like it's with spatter you know around so so probably a soldering iron that's that's too high of a wattage and just loading the solder well not too much but yeah so um, I'm gonna clean up those uh, joints and give this thing a uh, dry brushing um, well, heck, I might as well use alcohol too because. But uh, anyway, so let me clean those up and uh, and and clean off the board, and then I think uh, I'm, I'll be comfortable to turn it on. need to hit it here and it'll come out. There. This one's being stubborn. Just have to get at it with heat on the one side and there we go. And on the other. There we go.
I'm sure I've done soldering jobs this bad. You know, I think we all have. When we were learning or when we were in a hurry or what have you. So. Not too hard on the person. Some people just, you know. Yeah, I don't know. Now, I think I'm going to make a, another visual inspection of this board. Just I'm going to look at every square inch of it, and then if I'm satisfied, I'm going to go ahead and uh, I could probably go over it again with alcohol. I mean, there's nothing uh, destructive left on the board, but you can see that it's kind of got a weird pattern on it because I, you know, I blew the alcohol off with air and. Moisture from the compressor will mix with it and and kind of dry on the board and give kind of a an ugly appearance to it, but it's fine, I assure you. Um, anyway, I'm going to take a look at this. Okay, I've had a look at the other side. It looks okay. I'm just while I'm looking at this side, I'm just going to dry brush. It's dusty anyway. Um, you know, like I said, everything kind of looks like it's in good shape. Got to be concerned with this area because this is where he said that that resistor R409 was smoking. But it really doesn't look like it has any nothing. You a resistor is not going to smoke and leave and leave absolutely no evidence of a burn. You know what I'm saying? It burns first and, and discolors first almost, you know, before it starts smoking. Now, I don't know about that one. I don't really see anywhere else in that vicinity that uh, that is gonna have, you know, that has any evidence of burning. Let's see. Oh wait. I do see evidence of a burn here, I think. So this is R406. I don't see um, a problem with the resistor, but it looks it's like it might be something discolored.
Does that look like a discoloration there? Let me take a closer look. Yeah, he mentioned that this resistor was the one that smoked, but I think it was this one because we see uh, some discoloration around there. And um, also it looks like this resistor was replaced. And it, this resistor, the work that was done to replace this resistor is pretty good actually. Um, you know, it was difficult to tell. The, the dead giveaway, I guess, is the fact that it's a little bit shinier um, than the others. Otherwise, it would be hard to really tell. There's one leg there and another leg there. Um, perhaps. But anyway, that's the only evidence I see. But I'm pretty satisfied with the what I'm seeing on the board right now. So, um, and I brushed the whole thing off. I don't think there's gonna be any shorts on it, so I think it's time to test it. Okay guys, we're doing this together. I have not seen what happens. We'll see what happens. Okay, so we have a video sync. Yeah, green screen, okay. All right, well, um, obviously at this point what you want to do is just swap chips out. So we'll start with Agnes and we'll work our way around and we'll see what's going on. Okay, so I've replaced Agnes and Gary and I also took the ROM out and put in Diagram. And I've seen this before. Yeah, green, red flash. Right now it's doing a test. If we had um, diagram running on a serial, we'd see that it's running through a test. And it's finding, uh, at this point, it would output no chip. I'm going to confirm that. I'm going to grab the laptop. and. All right. Let's see what goes on here. Yeah, it can't access any of the memory. It says address and write and read and then failed. And then it says no chip memory detected. So it does that for about 10 or 15 seconds as it goes through every single address. Uh, in fact, I think it does the same address is multiple. It's, yeah, it's doing, um, how many numbers are there? Uh, one, two, three, four, five. It's doing five different ranges of addresses until it fails. So um, at this point, I think um, I can either get out the oscilloscope and see if the memory chips are, are getting a signal. Um, or, I mean, every single, well, let's see, I've seen this twice, and both times it was the chip, memory chips. So, um, yeah. I guess I'll go ahead and just start pulling memory chips and replace them. And, and I'm probably going to find one or more bad memory chips. Okay, so uh, I piggybacked the first chip. Same problem. Piggybacked the second chip, same problem. Piggybacked the third chip, same problem. Piggybacked all four, and I think probably smart enough to know. Where I'm headed with this, especially if you saw the screen just then. Yeah, okay, so, uh, that's good. Get rid of this baggy jacket. It's raining outside. It's a good thing I don't have to retro bright anything. Not. Okay. Um, yeah. All right. So let's uh, turn it off and start removing the chips in the reverse order. Obviously, if I take this one off, it's going to fail because with these three piggybacked, it still failed until, so this chip is for sure bad. We know that for sure. Now we're going to find out if it's more than one. 
by pulling the first chip off. Again, this might be pretty elementary for some people, but... Okay, so that chip is good. Um, turn it off, pull the second one off, turn it back on. So the first two chips going from right to left seem okay. <clears throat> and we'll pull the third one from the right. Oh, two bad mem chips. Pretty par for the course. I mean, it's usually and they, it's it's usually two that are right next to each other, just like that. Most of the time, in my experience, two chips go bad, and they're the two right next to each other, and they share a lot of addressing and stuff. So anyway, uh, two bad chips. So let's desolder them, um, socket them, stick to. Of these chips in their spot test to make sure we're good and then do a full test to make sure there's no other problems put the original chips back in of course um, the original chips are here just do a full test of it after that with Amiga test kit and uh, hopefully we've got this problem licked oh and by the way um, had another fail uh, in Steve, our donor board, the one that has all the chips socketed, I accidentally took the 74LS244 off of him and stuck it on here, and of course that killed that chip. Fortunately, it didn't ruin anything on the motherboard, but hey, there's another fail by me because I was in too much of a hurry. And uh, you gotta take your time. That's the only thing I can tell you. <laughs> Make sure you're doing the right thing. So fortunately, we didn't have any permanent damage. I have, of course, extra 74LS244 logic chips. Popped one in into Steve, and, and it's fine. Got to throw the other one away. It had a ni nice smell, and it uh, got quite hot. I didn't leave it on there enough to uh, burn it up, but obviously the voltage rail, the voltage pin is different on a uh, 74LS244 than it is on these, uh, these uh, um, RAM chips. Okay, so let's... Uh, Let's take care of these chips. Let's let's desolder them. I'll go through it really quickly. I'll probably put it in fast forward with some captions. I, I I've done it before on my other videos, but I like to just repeat it. And um, uh, in case somebody se sees this video but doesn't really in isn't really interested in the other ones, um, you know, like I know I did it in the 2000 video and some 500 videos. So anyway, let me uh, get this set up and we'll continue.
Okay, um, we're ready to do a real test. Got the two new RAM chips in there. Um, put his original Agnes and original Gary back in. And also the original ROM, the 1.3. And we're going to, oops, got the ribbon cable upside down. I saw the one over here, that's always confusing. There's a one here and a one here. The one here is referring to that, that adjacent. Unfortunately, nothing bad happens when you put the cables in backwards. Otherwise, it would have happened to me a couple of times. All right, let's see. Um... I'll show you what I'm doing there. It's not just a it's not just a dirty contact. It's a it's a broken solder joint, I think. Okay, so I'm wiggling it now, but you can't really see it. I can't really see it, but when I put my finger on it and wiggle it, I can feel it wiggling underneath my finger. That's the thing about cold solder joints or broken solder joints. A lot of times you can't even tell visually or even when wiggling it, but you just have to take it on faith. Like keyboards, I, I don't know if I've ever seen a keyboard solder joint that I de definitively determined as being bad, but when I reflow them, that, that's been the most common problem with keyboards, Amiga 500 keyboards. But yeah, I can feel that as opposed to the other one when I wiggle it, I don't feel it moving, so I think that's the problem. Okay, added some solder to that joint, and um, uh, the reason why it's moving more is not because of that solder joint, which may or may not have. Uh, may or may not have been cold or broken and it didn't look like it to me but let's just see here okay hopefully that let me turn that down just a little bit okay so you know there's a the center pin the, the you know the, the tip of, the, of these RCA jacks, you know, slides in and gets gets captured, you know, and squeezes itself into a contact that is directly connected to this bar. And that contact, um, it just, you know, over year over the years, it, it will sort of wear itself open, you know, after maybe people yanking on it sideways or just through use or whatever. So I just took this pick with the, with the jack out. I took this pick. And I don't know if you can, I guess maybe I'm going to get a shot of it close up with the macro. Okay, so there is a sleeve right there inside. And so I took this pick and I slid it in between the sleeve and the ceramic uh, outer part. And there's two pieces. There's one on this side, and then there's a break in the center, and then there's one on this side. So I took this and ran it down through, and so I could push those two things that are like this in like this, um, so that they made better contact with um, the center tip of the RCA jack. And sure enough, that fixed it. It's still a little wiggly, but you know, I don't see the reason to replace it or anything. It, it works fine now, so even when you wiggle it, so. 
Anyway, so that's the ending of that test. Let's just put a game on or two and make sure we're good there. I died. Okay, well you get bored of that game quickly. <laughs> okay, so Attack of the Planet of the Robot Monsters or whatever it is. Um, it, my HDMI adapter that I sell didn't like it and I think it's because this is an NTSC motherboard but it looks to be running in PAL. It's got an 8372 um, let me just verify that pin 41 is grounded. If that's the case, somebody did a mod to, to make the uh, output be um, in PAL. And for whatever reason, my HDMI adapter board doesn't like that. My VGA one uh, is okay with it because that's what I'm using now to display it. Yes, and the um, oscillator on this is yeah, this is definitely an NTSC uh, motherboard. The oscillator is uh, 28.63636 um, uh, megahertz. Yeah, um, and that is an NTSC chip uh, oscillator. Okay, so um, yeah, JP4 looks like somebody put a solder blob really thin one like it's barely making a connection but yeah it looks like it's short so this has been converted with um, using this chip you have to have a fatter Agnes the uh, ECS Agnes 8372 and a release 6 or new motherboard and JP4 if you short it it turns it into a PAL machine and you can actually put a switch on that obviously to toggle between NTSC and PAL um, but the oscillator is the wrong oscillator and uh, that causes problems with some displays so uh, that's very noteworthy. Um, so uh, my HDMI adapter doesn't like it at all. It hates that. My VGA adapter is fine with it, um, at least in my test. So anyway, this motherboard is wrapped up. Everything's working with it. I'm going to send it back to the person who sent it to me. And, uh, and uh, he should be happy to get it back, all working. Mm -hmm.